Hey, uh, we are continuing in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we are in chapter 7. We are getting close to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, as we've examined the words of Jesus, as he is talking to disciples to say, this is what it means to follow me. He has talked through Beatitudes and he has come against the, the ideas of the Pharisees and the way they interpret the law as this kind of bare minimum, just sliding by kind of mentality. Uh, we've looked at different relationships. Last week, we talked about relationships with dogs and pigs. I mean, God is covering the bases. Jesus is making sure everything is taken care of. And we talked about our relationship with our brother and our sister and the understanding of removing the plank from our eye before we work to remove the speck from our brother's eye. And what does it mean then to truly be a brother or a sister to those around us? And today we're going to continuing, continue to look at relationships. And today we're going to look at a relationship with our heavenly father. Now, I am like most men in a lot of ways. I'm sure I'm different than some of y'all in some ways. But uh, I, what I mean by that is I am not quick to ask somebody at a store where something is located, which has at times caused some tension in the home where Lauren was like, well, did you ask? Point in case, this past week, we have been working through uh, some remodel stuff in the home. We have a, a wonderful home, but it's an old home, right? If you live in the area, you know what I'm talking about. Our house was built in 1954. And so that means there are constantly projects and things to be done, updating in certain places. So we've been working in our bathroom and it came time to install the shower glass, which is a victory, which means we're gonna get our shower back. Actually, today we get to use our shower. So thank you, Jesus. So I say that so you know that in the end, I did get the job done. <laughs> this past week, I'm going to install the shower glass. I get it all marked up. I get it measured. All the holes are marked. I got the, the tape on the porcelain tile. There is little Sharpie marks. I know exactly where to drill. This is going to line up perfectly. We're going to put the shower glass up, and it's going to be wonderful. And I go to use the drill, and I get to the porcelain tile, and I start drilling to no avail. And I'm like, this drill bit's not working. And I was trying it, knowing that it was gonna be difficult with the drill bit that I had, just using a regular masonry bit. I knew would be a bit of a stretch, but I thought we'll give it a shot nonetheless. And no, we made it halfway through one porcelain tile before I said, it's been about 35 minutes. I'm probably gonna have to find another solution. I had seven more holes to go and hadn't even finished the first one. So I run to the store with a certain drill bit in mind, knowing what I should get because I have drilled through these tiles before and done some things. And so I'm going, okay, I know what I need. So I go and I'm looking and I'm looking and I'm looking and I find something else. And I grab it and I get home and Lauren says, did you get what you need? And I said, yep. And I begin to drill, still having no luck. And so Lauren, being resourceful, begins to Google and YouTube what to do to make it happen. And so she comes to me, and she says, oh, this is the type of bit you need. And what do I say? That's what I was actually looking for, but I couldn't find it. And she asked me, did you ask someone? I gave her a short, sweet, simple answer. No. There was no asking. Nothing involved in the process. So what was that for Ryan? Back to the store was what I saw in my future. But then she looked and she found this other thing. And ultimately, they didn't have it in the store. So we got to order it on Amazon and have it delivered. And now, just so you know, again, the shower glass is up. It is installed. It is the silicone is in all around. Tonight, we get to use our shower. But had I stopped and asked, we probably could have used it on Friday. There's something profound in the asking that, that unlocks things in, in mysteries that perhaps we have missed or overlooked or not seen because there's this thing that gets in the way sometimes called pride that keeps us from being willing to step out and say, I need help. I need direction. I need provision. And there is something profound in the asking. So today, if you have your Bibles, I want you to open to uh, Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, uh, verse 7 through 11. Today, I would love to get through verse 12. We are not going to get through verse 12. There's just too much in verse 12. So my encouragement to you before we even begin, this week, 
read and digest and chew on verse 12. It is what we call the golden rule. Uh, do unto others as you would have them do to you. And I think I want a little King James there. It's how it's memorized. So you just got to roll with that sometimes. But, but study in on that. This understanding of kindness, it's wow. It's so profound that Jesus calls us to be kind to people. And if you struggle with that, let the word of God sink into your heart as you study that this week. But today, we're going to look at verse 7 through 11. It says this, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Verse 9, which of you... If your son asks for bread, we'll give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Father, today I pray, God, that as we walk through this word, Lord, that our hearts are challenged in the world of prayer. Lord, that you allow us to have a shift in our mindset and our thoughts as we study your word today. We give you glory. We give you honor for it in Jesus' mighty name. James 4 tells us that, that we have not because we ask not. Or in essence, the Lord has not brought provision because we've not stopped long enough to ask. And Jesus now, at the second point in the Sermon on the Mount, is dealing with the idea of prayer. He's already talked about prayer in chapter 6. And, and we, yes, we looked at it from the sense of, he says, don't be like the Pharisees and the hypocrites who go out on the street corners and, and, and pray in such a way to draw attention to themselves. He says, don't be like the pagans using their many words, thinking that if I pray a long, a long enough prayer, if I, if I say the right kind of chance and things of that nature that the Lord is going to hear me. And then he gives this outline and this model through the, the, the prayer, you know, the Lord's prayer, just talking about how to pray. But when you pray, rather go to the Lord who already knows before you even ask. And we see Jesus talking about prayer. And now he's come back yet again to emphasize prayer. I think if there's anything that we first pick up before we even dig into the understanding is this overarching understanding that prayer is important. It is not something to just consider, but it is something to apply, something to use, something to be a part of our spiritual disciplines and our walk with Jesus. In his book, uh, The Message of the Sermon on the Mount, John Stott looks at this passage from three different perspectives, and, and those are the promise Jesus makes, the problems men raise, and the lessons we learn so let's start today by talking about the promises Jesus makes or the promise Jesus makes. He says that if we ask, seek, and knock, that we will find, the door will be open, it'll be given. But the first thing we have to understand is that his promises are attached to direct commands. It is not just this open-ended, I'm just going to start giving because I recognize your need. But there, it starts with asking, with seeking, and with knocking. And all these verbs indicate the persistence with which we should make our request known to God. That we should continue to come, that we should continue to pray, continue to ask, seeking and knocking. This is to say we don't simply just pray one time and we walk away. Like, well, have you prayed about it? I did once. Yeah, I prayed. And what did the Lord say? I don't know. It's kind of silent. It was like, Lord, are you there? Like, what did you pray again? Well, absolutely not. I asked that one time. So Jesus is talking about persistence, continuing to go to the Lord, continuing to ask. Can he answer in a singular moment? Absolutely. There are those moments and times when, when we need immediate wisdom, immediate direction, and the Lord understands the, 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 the nature of the situation, and God can speak in a moment's notice. I've experienced it in my own life, right, where, where I've asked a prayer immediately, and the Lord responds and says, yes, this is the way to go. This is the right thing to do. But then there are other times, most often with larger things in life that are kind of looming and hanging overhead, that it's not just an immediate response. Wouldn't you love when you were in college, and you stopped, and you prayed, and said, Oh, Lord, what is the direction for my life? What are you calling me to? What are you asking me to? And the Lord would just begin to go, all right, get out the pen and paper, get ready. 
I'm going to lay it out for you day by day. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And you could wake up every day going, nope, this is the will of the Lord for my life today because he told me in 2003 that on August 20th, 2020, right? The Lord didn't speak like that. There is this persistence that we have to develop, this asking, this seeking, and this knocking. And we see this uh, as, as if it is a growing uh, a persistence. We think about a child, and some of you are parents, a lot of you are parents, but, but at some point, you yourself were, in fact, a child. So I think this will resonate in our understanding. See, when you have a child, uh, and they are looking for their mom or have a question for their mother, it will start with kind of shouting out and asking, like, Mom! Mom! We had two boys. Uh, our youngest one was the, the biggest and, and the most repetitive with the saying of the word mom. And, and in fact, there was video, we have video upon video upon video of Boston at like two and three years old, just being like, ma, ma, and it was ma. It wasn't mom, ma, 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 ma. And he was like, yes, yes, child, yes, right? There is this, but it's just this asking. So when a child is looking for their mom, they're going to start with just this asking, like, mom, where are you? Mom, where are you? Like, mom. And then when they don't hear a response, what are they going to do? They are going to go looking and searching for mom. And they're seeking all over the house, looking for mom. Like, you know what? Saying it wasn't enough. So now I've got to get up and move and go find. And what's great about a three-year-old is they are persistent in their search for mom. And where do they find mom? hoping to use the bathroom for the first time that day in the bathroom. This is their five minutes alone. And what happens? They, they go, they, the child realizes mom is in the bathroom. So then comes the knocking, the ma, and the fingers under the door. It's the only way it works. Because they know that if I can just reach under there, she knows it's me now. And then you lay on the, they lay on the, listen, I remember this vividly as a child. My mom trying to use the bathroom and I'm laying on the ground and I'm like, mom, right? And you're just on the ground. Because there is this escalating persistence that we see, and the Lord is trying to, and so he's like, this is already innate in you. This is already a part of who you are. But if you could get the same persistence towards me that you have in trying to find your own mom who just wants five minutes of quiet in the bathroom, bring your requests and make them known to me. Ask, seek, and knock. This is the command given to the promises that Jesus says is if you ask, you will receive. If you seek, you will find. If you knock, the door will be open. There are times in our prayer life, in our pursuit of Jesus and coming near to him that we have to develop some persistence in our pursuit of the promises of Jesus. And we gotta learn to ask, to seek, and knock. And he illustrates this to us, that this idea of of the fact that the Lord will give, and not just give, but he will give good gifts. He says, if you, as a parent who are evil, or, or rather not perfect, right, but we are evil people, sin has infiltrated this world. He said, and if you, who, who are evil, knows how to give a good gift to your own child, how much greater are the gifts that God gives, right? So the first layer of that is he says, if, if, you, if your child asks for a loaf of bread or asks for some bread, you're not gonna be like, hey, this stone kind of looks like bread. Go eat that, kid. And if you do, that's a problem. And we need to sit down and talk about this. Or the same thing if your child says, oh, I would like some fish. I want to fish. You're not going to go and be like, ah, here's a snake. Like, this doesn't compute. And Jesus is saying, and you recognize that even though we are flawed humans. That's why we laugh at the idea of like, hey, I asked for bread. You gave me a stone. I asked for fish. You gave me a snake. Jesus is going, you get that. And he says, and if you know how to give good gifts to your own children, how much greater is the ability of God to give good gifts to you and I? And to hear our request and to say, this is good. And now here's the deal. I wasn't always a good gift giver. I have gotten better. In fact, Lauren and I's first date, I was taking her out for her 18th birthday, okay? This is because we've been together for a long time at this point. Not that she's old, I'm old. Let me clarify. No, for her, it's only been like six years. For me, it's been 16. Okay, let me just clarify. And in fact, I had a gift for her for her birthday that she never got. 17 years later, Lauren never got her gift for me for her 18th birthday. It was not a good gift giver. My dad, on the other hand, is a fantastic gift giver. 
Like he relishes the moment to give the good gift. And usually every year at Christmas, the, the, the part that we look forward to the most is when my dad gives the gift to my mom. Like he's just really good at it. And it's usually extravagant and over the top. And we all go, my goodness, dad, you did it again. Like it's just like this, it's, but he's gotten himself in this perpetual cycle of having to outdo himself. So every now and then he just kind of goes, all right, we're gonna bring the bar down this year so we can build it back up for the next few years. So this, like there, there's those moments. Like a couple years ago though, he got my mom a ring that had the birthstone of every grandchild and he had it made for her, like just wild gift. And it was like, we were all like, whoa, this is wild, right? And so, so all the grandkids and, and the kids, so there's like 11 stones on this thing. It was just awesome, right? So he gives these great gifts. I remember one year as a kid being the recipient of the great gift. And he never just does it. It's never like wrapped and under the tree, like, oh, hey, mom's gonna open her gift now. Or, oh, hey, look, Ryan's got a gift. No, 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 no. It's always like, there's some sort of way that he gives the gift, right? It has to be a production. It has to be kind of seen and, and a big deal in the moment because he enjoys giving good gifts. So I remember one year, it was Christmas time. I, I had been playing guitar for a little while and I wanted a new guitar, but I was also a senior in high school and I wanted a class ring. It was a big deal to me. But if you don't know, class rings cost money. And, and it, especially the way we did it at Naaman back in the day, it wasn't like there was one design that you picked. You got to go and design your class ring. And I think you still do the same thing at this point. It's not like they've gone backwards uh, with things in this world. And I remember going, man, I really want a class ring, but I also want a new guitar. And I had saved up my money for a new guitar and, and I was just waiting. And I remember Christmas day comes and I open a new guitar for my parents. And I was like, this is awesome. This is really cool. And while we were walking down to, we had a metal building storage barn thing out to go see my mom's gift. Okay, this is a true story. That's uh, so why I bring that all back, right? Like my dad had got her something big down there. On the way down there, my dad is just walking like this and he reaches into his pocket and he goes, oh yeah, Merry Christmas. And he hands me a class ring. And I thought I was gonna have to pick one or the other and I ended up getting both. And it was like this wild moment. And I see that and I say that to say this, if our parents who at some level, their love is finite, their goodness is finite. It has an end to it. If, if my dad is that good at giving gifts, how much greater is our heavenly father at giving good gifts? How much greater is he at times of bringing in those surprises when you go, man, I was asking for this and in my heart, I wanted this, but I knew that that was gonna be too much. And the Lord says, yo, no, it's not too much for me. I'm able to give good gifts. We ask we seek and we knock. And our Father, who is able, gives good gifts. So the promise of Jesus is that if we ask, we will receive. If we seek, we will find. If we knock, the door will be open. The second thing is this. We see the problems men raise when it comes to prayer. We often find ourselves struggling with prayer, right? Right? This is something that we do. Uh, and whether that's from uh, reasons connected to schedule, if that's connected to the busyness of life, oftentimes prayer is usually one of the first things to get moved off of the agenda of the day. And sometimes it's rooted in deeper ideas. It's rooted in deeper problems and things that, that begin to rise to the surface through the busyness of our lives and our schedules. And so there's a few things that, that I find happen to uh, come to the surface in this process of why don't we pray? The first is, is people make the argument that prayer is unnecessary. And here's what I mean by that, is that the, the basis of this idea is, is of experience and not of theology, of course. And it can happen to any follower of Jesus. They look around at many other Christians who seem to receive without prayer the very same things that we receive with it. And we come to the conclusion that prayer must be unnecessary because there are those who are receiving blessings from the Lord without praying for it and asking for it. Let me, let me illustrate it this way. We see the farmer works for his harvest and he reaps a harvest by work and not by prayer. Food is on the table by earning wages, wages, not by prayer. And, and so we come to this conclusion and we begin to say, is prayer even necessary? 
but we have to learn to differentiate a couple of different things. One, we have the creator gifts that God gives gifts to his creation, that as being a part of the creation of the Lord, there are certain aspects of God that ring true for all of humanity. We know that he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, right? That the rain comes on, on the righteous and the unrighteous. And we see that the gifts of God that are given to creation are, are available to all of humanity without question. But then comes the matter, though, of the gifts of the Father. And that shifts a little bit. So is prayer necessary? The answer is absolutely yes. Because you see, even salvation begins with prayer, that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. But but that is just the beginning of of what we receive through prayer of the good gifts of the Father. So it starts redemption, yes, but that that comes through asking, seeking, knocking. But there are continued gifts of, of his grace and his mercy. There is forgiveness and deliverance. There is peace, the increase of faith, hope, and love. There is the infilling of the Holy Spirit and the gifts that follow, all of which come through prayer. In the seeking of the Lord, the asking for, the seeking for, the knocking and saying, Lord, is is prayer unnecessary? Absolutely not. It is vital and needed in our receiving all of the good gifts of the Father that he has for us as we are in pursuit of him and say, God, I need more faith today. I need more hope today. I need deliverance today. Lord, fill me with your spirit fresh and new today so I can walk in the fullness of who you've called me to be, so I can walk in the giftings that you have equipped me with, so that I can be who I'm called to be. The other argument is that prayer is unproductive. It's unnecessary because many people who who, who don't pray get the same as those who do. It's unproductive because many people who pray never see what they ask for. This becomes the other argument is that, well, this is unproductive. I've prayed for this and I've asked for this and yet the Lord has not responded. I prayed for healing and I got worse. I prayed for peace and there's greater turmoil. I prayed to pass the exam, and I failed. That was my story most of college, in case you're wondering. And then I was reminded of a verse where the Lord said, study to show yourself approved. And I was like, wait, that, that is connected to that promise as well? Like, I just can't wing it? Okay, all right. We learned that lesson the hard way. But don't worry, we graduated. So let's start by looking at the Sermon on the Mount as we recognize, is this unproductive? The promises of the Sermon on the Mount are not unconditional. And we see this not just with ask, seek, and and knock, but we see this in other portions of the Sermon on the Mount. We have to first understand that the promise, ask and it will be given, is not an absolute pledge of Jesus knock and the door will be open is not this magical open sesame idea of the Lord that any door you ask or any door that you knock, I'm going to open it. That, that's, the Lord is not saying that this is just a across the board, no questions asked. This is what it's going to be. The reality is, is if we had the ability like Aladdin to treat God as a genie in the lamp, we would diminish who God is as creator of all things, as the Lord of all lords and, 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 and the most holy of gods. We would reduce him simply to our servant to do our bidding. So God in his infinite goodness and his wisdom allows to give what is good, not just in the moment, but what is good for the will of God moving forward. And there are times when we have to wrestle with the fact that the Lord has said no to things while saying yes to others. And sometimes his yes is answered. It's a whole other thing than what we ask for because he knows what we need before we even ask for it. I'll I'll paraphrase Alec Montier, who was a a theologian uh, who passed away in 2016, actually, but he said, paraphrase, I believe that we would find that none of us have the wisdom necessary to ask God for anything if The understanding was that whatever we asked, he gave. Whatever we sought, we found. Whatever door we knocked on, he opened. He said, I don't think we have the wisdom and the capacity to carry that kind of power. We are not magicians that are wielding some sort of magical trick with with God at the palm of our hand. The Lord, in his infinite wisdom, says, I will not allow them to have yes to everything. 
It makes me think of the movie Bruce Almighty, which is just a, it's funny and probably not theologically accurate, but just in case you're wondering. But there's the moment where he receives the email as God, and he was like, uh, I got to answer all of these. Like, you know, it's the prayers that are coming in, and it's an email, and he's like, oh my goodness. So what does he do? He replies, yes to all. And there is mass pandemonium. Because now you have people praying against each other, and he just said yes to both. And now you had the whole, like, half of Boston or wherever he's at that asked to win the lottery, and he just said yes to them all, right? There's a reason why the Lord in his goodness and his wisdom says, I know what is right and I know what needs to be done. I know what is good for you. Because why? He is an infinitely good father who recognizes that there are things that we may ask for that we should not receive. He says, you know, uh, we, we recognize it in the sense that if you ask for bread, he's not going to give you a stone. But what if in our, our ignorance, we are asking for a stone? What if in our ignorance, we're asking for a snake? The Lord, as a parent, right? If your child says, man, dad, could I really, I would really love to eat a stone for dinner. I'm not about to walk outside and be like, here you go, bud. Eat that because I have to pay the dental bills. So I recognize that's not good for him. So instead of giving him the stone he's asking for, I'm gonna say, you know what? How about some bread instead? I won't get into the snake thing because I had a pet snake and it'll only stir up things in the home later on from children asking for a snake. So we're just gonna leave that one be for right now. It was a python, in case you're wondering. It was about five feet long. I wish I still had them. Don't use that against me later, child. Okay. So we have to understand that even in our ignorance when we ask for things that are not good, God at times has to say, you don't know what you're asking for. You don't understand the ripple effect of me saying yes to that would be. So in his goodness and in his wisdom, he says, I'm going to say no to that, but instead I'm going to actually bring what you need. And learning to say, okay, prayer is not unnecessary. It's not unproductive, but there are levels to God's wisdom and his understanding that we will never grasp and we can trust the Lord through it. That should only fuel us to be consistent in our asking and our seeking. So in that, let's be thankful that God does not give us everything we ask for, but that in his wisdom, he leads. The third thing is the lessons we learn. There, there's a couple of things that I wanna point out that, that I think, are, listen, there's too much on the subject of prayer to cover in one day, fair? fair. There's too much to cover in like six weeks. So there's just, we'll do our best today with, with, with kind of this, this overview, uh, in essence, of prayer. It hopefully it spurs us on to a greater desire and purpose. Effective prayer, as it, it is stated by Jesus, sounds very simple. Ask, seek, knock. If you do these things, every prayer will be answered, right? That's just the, the quick, but this is a misled understanding of what Jesus has taught on the subject of prayer in the Sermon on the Mount. So three quick thoughts on the lessons that, that we either need to learn or that we've learned through it. One, prayer supposes knowledge. So, so God gives gifts in accordance to his will, right? So the first thing we have to do before we even step into full understanding of prayer is we have to understand the will of God. And where do we find his will? In the word of God. So, so in order to pray the will of God, we first have to know the word of God. We have to understand. So my encouragement is this. If you are not reading and studying the word of God, there is going to be a difficult time for your heart to become in alignment with the will of God, to be able to pray his good and perfect will. And so it starts with knowing the word of God. So I encourage you, if you don't have regular practice in the word of God, get in the word of God. I've said this so many times, but, but if you just have to start with five minutes of reading and you go, this is what I have right now. I'm going to build this up. I'm going to get better. S set your alarm five minutes earlier. I I've said this challenge to so many people. Set your alarm five minutes earlier and say, okay, I've got five extra minutes in my morning now. Don't fill that with nonsense. That is not a time to be scrolling on your phone. You stop and you say, okay, I'm going to open my Bible. And listen, I can get into my whole thoughts about reading from your phone versus reading a Bible. I'm not going into that. I'm just encouraging you. Read the word of God. If it's on your phone, that's not wrong. Fair? I just try to minimize distraction. 
okay? So if that's how you do it, the Lord is not angry or looking down upon you. Consume the word however you consume it. But start there. Be in the word of God because you can't know the will of God if you don't know the word of God. They go hand in hand. And so we start from a place of knowledge. So when we begin to pray, we allow the word of God to mold us and shape us and allow our hearts to come into alignment with the will of God, not just for our lives, but for the world around us and for eternity as a whole. Amen? Okay. Well, <laughs> thank you. Uh, amen. That's a good spot to be like, yes, we want the will of God in this world. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So let's start there. The second thing is this, prayer supposes faith. It says, when I go to pray, it's to say, okay, I've recognized now the will of God. And so now I'm gonna pray with the belief that God can do his will, that God can make this happen. So when I step into prayer, my faith comes alive within me and that it allows then to open access to the work and the leading of the Lord. Let me encourage you in this. We do not pray to inform the Lord of what we need. We don't pray to inform the Lord of the problems going on down here. I say this a lot when we talk about prayer. Now, prayer is not our moment to be like, hey God, I know you haven't been watching. Uh, I know that you've just kind of, uh, you're doing your thing up there. You got heaven to run. It's a big operation, okay? Uh, but I just wanna let you know that, that there's some needs down here and the Lord's not going, what? Right? Like, I don't know. I just went full on Scooby-Doo for a second there. I don't know. I don't know what that was. Uh, FYI, that's not in my notes. So be like, go Scooby-Doo on this. Okay. <laughs> but there is this understanding that the Lord is saying, okay, this is not about me be, being informed, but this is about your faith recognizing my ability to do. I say a lot of times, Lord, it's a, it's a prayer that I pray. God, don't let my faith be the limitation on what you accomplish. We allow our faith to rise up. We recognize the will of God and we have the faith to say, God can do and complete and accomplish his will. And then the third thing is this prayer presupposes desire. It's one thing to know the will of God. It's another thing to believe that God is able. It's another thing altogether to desire the will of God to be done. And I think the question has to come back to the surface and that, that we examine is, do I want the will of God to be done? Do I truly long for and anticipate God to do his will? Is there something within me that says, I want to see the Lord's will done in my life? I want to see the Lord's will done in the world around me. See, see, there is desire that has to be dwelling within us as we come to prayer. John Stott, in, in reference to Romans 10, 1, says, prayer is the chief means God has ordained by which to express our deepest desires. And when our heart is in alignment with the will of God, we want nothing more than his will to be done in my life, in my family, in my job, in my community, in our city, in our church, in the world around us. And we go to the Lord and we ask and we seek and we knock and we say, Lord, let your will be done. God, bring the good things that you see in your goodness and in your wisdom and allow those to play out in my heart and in my life because we know that you know what we need before we even ask. And so it comes down to the question, do I truly desire the Lord's will to be done? I'll invite Peyton to join me. So the question comes down to the simple statement, do we want the will of God? Do we want it for our lives? Do we want it for our family? Do we want it for our community, for our church, or for our world? Is that truly the case? Is, does our desire within us say, I want the will of God, or does our desire within us say, I want my will to be done? Because if there's a, an understanding and a desire for God to, to have his way, then that means that we are not sitting on the throne of our hearts, but we are allowing the Lord to lead us and to guide us in all things. That we have truly removed ourselves from the place of authority and said, Lord, your will be done. I think we see such a beautiful 
weaving of the Lord's prayer into this model of asking, seeking, and knocking, as the Lord says, we, we, we seek the will of God. We say, Lord, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How wonderful would that be? to just truly allow the Lord to walk in complete freedom in our world. That just as it is in heaven, right? In heaven, there's nothing restricting or limiting the will of God to be done. There is nothing that is coming against a force of nature of any kind or a force of evil that is keeping the Lord from doing his will in heaven. And so we say, Lord, let it happen the same way here. Is that our desire to truly walk and live in such a way that the will of God has complete freedom and reign in our lives, in our families, in our children, in our marriages, in our community, in this church, that we say, God, my desire more than anything is that your will be done. And so we ask and we seek and we knock and we say, Lord, come, Lord, come, Lord, come. Your will be done. Your will be done. It's not me. It's not about me. It's not about what I want, but Lord, it's about your goodness your perfect will. I'm going to have everybody stand this morning. You've been sitting long enough. I see the time and, and I realized that went longer than I anticipated. So it's good. It's good. It's the anointing. Amen. You feel that? Man, that's a typical pastor joke. You preach long, you just blame it on the spirit. Oh man, it's not fair. The Holy Spirit was like, I told you to stop talking 10 minutes ago. <laughs> this is blatant disobedience at this point. My question is, do we desire the will of God? Because if we truly desire, what we see here is this, that if we truly desired it, we would rearrange our schedules to ask, seek, and knock. Because if we desired the will of God, no longer would prayer have to get worked into our schedule, but our schedule would have to work around our prayer. If we truly said, Lord, I want your will done in my life, in my family, in my home, in our community, in our world. If we truly long for that, and then we'll say, okay, all of these other things that I try to work in, I'm going to piece them in where I can later because this right here is when I'm just going to go to the Lord and he's going to hear my desire and my longing to say, God, I just want your will. I want your will to be done, Lord. You, you see, and the, the more you seek the Lord and the more you come into the presence of the Lord, the more you're in the word of God, the more your heart and your desire comes into alignment with his will. And then you begin to see effectiveness in your prayer life because now you are praying in step with the Father. And when you pray in step with the Father, it, the, the possibilities are limitless because God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than you can ask, think, imagine. Because he is good. He is great. He is powerful. So my question is, do you desire the will of God in your family, in your life, if that's you, would you just lift your hands to Jesus this morning and just say, Lord, Father, right now, you see, see the hands lifted in this place. You see the hearts yielded towards you and say, God, Lord, I want your will in my life. Lord, I want my desire to be your desires. Lord, I want my heart to come into your life. Lord, let my faith be stirred with the understanding, God, that, that you can do your will. And so, God, not do I just want to believe your will to be done. Not do I want to just think that you are able, Lord, and have faith to believe that you can do it. But, Lord, I want my heart to be in a place of desiring your will to be done in my life. And so, Lord, I surrender my heart in this moment right now. I turn my heart to you, my mind to you. Lord, come on, just begin to lift your voice and just begin to say, God, let your will become my desire. Lord, we ask that your will be my desire. Your will be the desire of our heart. Your will, Lord, begin to lead our homes and our families and our lives and our thoughts that in all things, God, there is a seeking after you and a running after you and the desires that, you, uh, that our hearts will be in alignment with the very will of God. Lord, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, God, we come before you and we say, Lord, rearrange my heart so that it's no longer about me and what I long for and, and my hopes and my dreams and ambitions if they are not in alignment with your will. God, in the areas that we've gotten off, I pray that you, you, you begin to bring us right back into alignment with your will. Bring us into alignment with your will as we learn to walk in the effectiveness of prayer, Lord. God, give us a persistence in us that says, I will not quit. I will not stop. I will keep running after the Lord. I'll keep running into the presence of God. And I'll have a desire in me that says, I cannot be defeated and I will not quit. I will overcome today. 
because I'm going to be persistent in my prayer. I'm going to be persistent in my seeking of the Lord. I'm going to be persistent in knocking. And Father, I'm going to walk in a different level in understanding what it means to be in pursuit of the will of God for my life, for my family, for my home, for my work, for my community. Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let our heart desire that in the name of Jesus. And Father, today, I pray, Lord, that as, as we digest this word and allow it to sink deep into our hearts, into our souls, into our minds, Lord, I pray that we leave transformed and changed by the word of God. And Lord, that your spirit will rest on us, that you will go with us, that you will lead us and guide us in all things. In the name of Jesus, I pray, oh God, that your Holy Spirit will cover us and let us walk in your freedom. God, I pray over those who responded for depression and anxiety. I speak freedom over them in the name of Jesus. God, even for the one who said, I've responded a million times and yet God never does. I pray, God, that this time, let it be different. Let it be different in the name of Jesus. God, I call the dead bones to live in the name of Jesus. Mm. Mm. In the name of Jesus. God, you see them. You see the pain they're walking with right now. God, you see the doubt that they're having right now. God, you're not going to do this. You've never done this before. Why would you do this now? I continue to carry this. And God, there is truly wrestling and arguing happening in their minds right now over depression and anxiety. Father, I, I, I pray that they recognize and realize that this is a blatant attack from the enemy trying to steal their joy and rob them from their freedom. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we say the lies of the enemy have to go. And that the joy of the Lord comes rushing in, in the name of Jesus. Let your spirit, oh God, rest. Oh, Jesus, walk with them. Victory, victory in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for your freedom. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. God, Paul made that very clear. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so, Father, we walk in your freedom. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen. Man, God is good. Man, I'm so thankful for the Lord. I honestly forgot y'all were going to say that. That caught me off guard. That's a true story. That just, I got shocked for a moment. Uh, I'm thankful for what God's going to do and what he's going to continue to do in your life and in your home and your family. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. We'll see you uh, next Sunday. And, and we'll just have a great time in the word of the Lord again and in the presence of God. Amen, amen, amen. Have a great week. The best is yet to come.